my name is Fabio Fernandez. I am the director of Greenwich House Pottery. And thank you for being here on 2-22-22. 2 2 Isn't that fortuitous? Um, so at uh, Greenwich House Pottery, we are part of the greater organization called Gre Greenwich House, which was started as a settlement house in 1902 as a way of welcoming immigrants to the New York community and helping them get acclimated through classes and programs in arts and culture. And then that grew to a variety of different programs that we have now. So Greenwich House has um, chemical dependency treatment programs. We have senior citizen centers. We have a music school and you're all here because we are at the pottery. So we have a, a three-story building in Greenwich Village where we offer classes, 57 classes a week to people age seven to 99. And we have classes in wheel throwing and hand building and slip casting. Um, our other program is an exhibition gallery where it's a, it's a very competitive exhibition gallery where we have six curated exhibitions a year. Um, I, I invite you to come visit at some point. And then our third program is an equally competitive um, program where we offer time and space to artists from around the country. They get a studio space, which we'll see a bit of, and they get technical assistance in realizing their work. And our residents vary from people who are very familiar with clay and all the processes and techniques and glaze chemistry and everything else to people who are artists but may not be terribly familiar with clay and that's where they draw upon our resources and our uh, technical assistance. Um, I will turn it over to my colleague, Caitlin McClure, who is not only the curator of our exhibition gallery but also the residency manager. Thanks Fabio and thank you everyone for coming and thank you to Shaleen for uh, an awesome residency. I, I can't believe it's the last week already. Um, this always happens, it goes much too fast. Um, but just a few Zoom rules. Uh, let's everyone stay muted uh, until the end of the talk. Uh, at the end, we can open it up for a QA. and a um, If you have a question that you're worried you're gonna forget, feel free to type it in the chat and I'll make sure that we ask it at the end. Um, but after Shaleen's talk, feel free to unmute yourself and ask any questions that you have. Um, so yeah, without any further ado, I'll do a short intro and we'll, we'll get going. Um, so Shaleen Rodriguez is an artist, educator, writer, and community organizer based in the Bronx. Her practice utilizes text, drawing, painting, collage, and sculpture to de depict spaces and subjects engaged in strategies of survival against erasure and subjugation. Um, so without any further ado, Shaleen, please take it away. Hi, everybody. Was good? Uh, thank you for pulling up to the Zoom talk. Um, okay, so first I want to just show off my brilliant idea of putting my laptop on a spinner so y'all can see what the residency room is like. I won't show you my mess, but I'll show you everything else. So this has been like where I've been cooking literally and figuratively, see the radiators. Um, <laughs> um, for the last like, like what, two months, give or take. Um, yeah, um, so I figured um, what I'll do is show you what my work has been like in the last couple years. And then I'll like hop over to what I've been doing here in relation to that. Um, so the work that I've been doing mostly, I'm gonna share my screen. So the work I've been doing mostly has been like large scale drawings. They range, they, they average about like four and a half feet to five feet uh, in size. Um, and it's black paper uh, with color pencil. And this has been like my medium of choice. They started kind of smaller, um, back in 2020 during the, the like pandemic, just because of like space restrictions and sheltering in place. I started doing the drawings. It was kind of like a back to basics kind of a deal uh, because there was nothing but time granted to us by a global pandemic. 
Um, and I just kind of been sticking with it, uh, sticking with the drawings because they just, uh, the drawings feel like, uh, you know, this idea of back to basics, this idea of like um, simplifying in the face of uh, such global dystopia um, to just simply looking. And I mean, like, it's not, it's not like it's a, uh, it's not like a too much off the beaten path of what I do already as an artist, which is like really just like, uh, you know, observe what's around me, where I, where I live, work, sleep, whatever, you know what I'm saying? Like just uh, very place-based, uh, you know, like my, the, my political work is place-based, is like where I live, um, you know, um, so the, of course in my my artistic practice is sort of that. So I'm just mostly like looking at the people in my neighborhood, looking at the space of my neighborhood and, you know, weaving, weaving together uh, or perhaps trying to indicate what the weaving together of a community looks like on the poetic realm, outside of the material organizing what realm that requires me to like take the hat, the artist hat off and put on the like, I'm part of this community, I'm an organizer hat. So, so I'll start with this image because like, this is probably like the closest to what it is. And then we'll zoom out and zoom back in. And then I'll show you some of the, some of the stuff that I made in here. So like this piece is called uh, India and Bangladesh. Now it's two women. So, so India here is, uh, this is like this old New Yorkian dyke from my neighborhood who like, you know, you know, she's like holds down the corner bodega, man. And that's what she does. You know, and, uh, I see her every day. Um, and her, her name is India and like, you know, India is kind of like an affectionate name for, you know, a more uh, red skinned, uh, red tone woman um, in like in Puerto Rican culture, you know, that, like, you know, you can pass for an Indian woman almost, you know, like it's, it's kind of silly, but it's like something that is like uh, just part of the culture, you know, so her name is India. And this woman here is her, is her neighbor um, or like, you know, just from the immediate community, you know. And this, in my community of, in Parchester, like uh, Soundview section of the Bronx, there's like a lot of people from Bangladesh in that neighborhood, huge Bangladeshi uh, uh, migrant population. So, so what you have is like a pun of like Indian Bangladesh who are like geographically located next to each other, like on a global scale. But then, you know, we kind of bring that down to the local where you have India and Bangladesh uh, side by side worlds apart but side by side united by shit like when the boiler breaks and there's no heat and hot water you know and so then that's where we get to this idea of like the social fabric you know um so i'm really interested in like how how uh the ways that solidarity can be weaved uh, beyond like you know culture like and the ways that we can like, perhaps like, you know, uh, take this interconnectedness that we have by living in the metropolis, you know, material interconnectedness, meaning like, you know, when the boiler breaks or like, you know, for example, um, and how that might relate to, uh, you know, things back home. We'll leave it there for now. So, you know, this is kind of like, where it where i'm at with the thinking behind it and if we zoom out of this like very specific um example you get you get stuff like this and so now so this piece is part of uh let me zoom out so you can see the whole thing a little bit better all right so so the way that i imagine it is like I create these pieces and then they are like the folks like India, Bangladesh, for example, like, you know, kind of like, who are pop populate this atmosphere, this like, this world be like, you know, are isolated and like highlighted on their own images, you know? Um, so a few things about this, a few things about this. Um, <clears throat> I like to think about these pieces as like the block. And when I say the block, you know, it's a very like, new, like this is very New Yorker thinking, 
language, aesthetic, the whole way, you know? So when I say the block, um, I don't just mean like my immediate street, but I mean like, I mean like, you know, the cluster of avenues and streets that like, that I might like, you know, traverse on an everyday basis. You know, it's not just to the edge of my, on, to the end of my corner on either side, but it's actually like that world that I like go to the drugstore in, or, you know, like go to get tacos from the taco truck in, like, you know, and all of the people that make up like the, the built environment of that world, you know? And so I think about these pieces like that. Um, I also, so a little backstory, and I should probably show you that. So let me do that. Let me, let me just do it real quick. That's, you know, there are no rules here. But yes, first, I'm going to just stop share real quick and then I'll just go back real quick. So stop share. Share again. Just because I want to show you a reference to what I'm looking at. So this, these are flyers, early hip hop flyers, um, all made by the man, this man right here, whose name is Buddy Esquire. Buddy Esquire designed over 300 flyers during the course of his life for hip hop acts that were emerging, like right in the beginning when, when hip hop was first sort of forming in the South Bronx um, in the late seventies. These are all archived now at like Cornell and different Ivy League universities. Buddy died, a UPS worker, broke as fuck, and excuse my language, um, you know what I'm saying? But he is known, like he is like, like, like Buddy is the guy who did this, you know? And so I like reference his work and like, you know, and like I, like I say his name to like, you know, keep him present uh, because what the flyers did, like, you know, he called them Neo Deco. Uh, you know, he's looking at, he himself is looking at like old boxing flyers, like, you know, maybe flyers that came out like Apollo theater, but also like, if you've ever been to the Bronx and a lot of people who are New Yorkers have like their grandparents were from the Bronx. You know, a lot of people are like, oh, my grandparents used to live in the Bronx back in the days. You know, like you see like like that time period is like a boom of like uh, like this kind of architecture. So that it's in the mind. It's in like, it's the way he's thinking. And so he, he would design these flyers, particularly looking at something like this. You can probably then see how this comes about. The framing of the of the image. So I'm referencing the flyers, <clears throat> and I'm referencing them for a specific reason. As I said, like Buddy Esquire was um, <clears throat> like was the king of the flyers, and he made these flyers. And you know, he's like like it's, it's important. It's a very important anchor, like in the formation of hip hop culture. Now, how do I think about hip hop culture? I consider myself a hip hop artist, not because of my you know, like amateurish background in graffiti, which I like by virtue of being a kid from the Bronx growing up in the 80s and 90s, I I was, you know, but through the sample and remix, through the pulling from a variety of sources to create something new, which is what hip hop culture does. Now, so that's that's a way to look at it like aesthetically and culturally. But if we look at hip hop culture socio-politically, what you get is an understanding that like, Hip hop is born literally at the same time that neoliberalism is put on the Petri dish in New York City. And it's on the heels of deindustrialization, which brought all of the Black and Puerto Rican folks from the South and from the Antilles to work factory jobs here who are like now out of work. And, you know, it's on the heels of like the, uh, the backlash against the anti war movement, the Black liberation movement. Um, so our people at the time that hip hop culture is born um, have taken an ass whipping. We've lost our like, leaders who are like either uh, executed or assassinated, jailed, exiled, so on and so forth. There is no like, like you know, there, there, what feels like a defeat is, can be viewed as not if you think about hip hop culture as like a cultural offensive. We were not in a position as a people to continue to respond with militancy against the state that had 
robbed us of our economic, um, like our, our economic resources, robbed us of our leaders, you know, but what we could do was build, like create culture in the midst of all of this destruction. So then the, the backlash, like the response to the state, like violence is to create a new avant-garde art movement, which gave you poetry, music, dance, the visual arts, you know? And so then I think of hip hop culture to bring it back to the work. I bring, I think of hip hop culture as uh, like, you know, the like uh, part of the legacy of like that resistance, you know? And so then, so then when I, so then like hip, then, then Buddy's hip hop fly, like hip hop flyers serve as a container for that legacy for me. And that's how I think of it. I'm like, okay, you know what? Why don't we, let's look at the structure there. This is a container now. And let's, let's start from there. That's, that's where, uh, that's the legacy we get to stand on as a, you know, that I get to stand on as, a, as an artist from the Bronx, you know? So then Buddy's work becomes a container. I kind of give it like this, like, uh, I give it like this, uh, like this, bodega neon kind of a flair to it which like makes it emerge from that blackness and like i could say something about like how this is like you know utilizing like uh techniques from the baroque but I, i'm not gonna go down that road because it's only 40 minutes boom but um <coughs> but then so then what happens is like uh you know like we have we're standing on we're standing on this structure right which is our legacy um but the bronx does not look like how it looked in 1975, 1985, 1995 even, you know, like today the Bronx might rival what, um, you know, what Queens is known for in terms of its diversity. Like, you know, like if, like if you've taught, uh, you know, a lot of artists are like teaching artists and like I have been myself and like te teaching in middle schools, you see who's really in, who's really there, you know, who's really here. When you want to know, you see who the kids are in schools. People from Bangladesh, as I mentioned, Yemen, Ghana, Senegal, Nigeria, Mexico, Honduras, you know what I'm saying? It's very rich with people coming from everywhere and living together, living together. And you know, like black people and Puerto Ricans and Dominicans, we're still here, but we're also like, but now we're, but now we're a multitude. We're much more of a multitude. And, and you know, like Stokely Carmichael and Huey P. Newton called like, you know, the places that we live, like, you know, the internal, like, you know, like the internal colonies, you know, like the, the internal third world, like, you know, those words ring, to, we might not use that language anymore. People might like to say global South, the internal global South, but all of those things ring true in terms of like, we are the periphery of the empire. We are on the margins of the empire. Um, um, and, and what kind of community and what kind of, uh, what, what kind of living, can we continue to do side by side as we, as more folks come in and we, re, we have to reinvent the, the, the social fabric, which means to break us, you know, if it's the, the, um, uh, you know, the, um, the tendency in the metropolis is more, I, more alienation, not less, you know, you have more people, but it's much more alienated. You ever go to a small town, you know what that, you know what I mean, you know? So anyway, this, these drawings like really reference that. And I use some of the language from the hip hop flyers because that's the legacy we're standing here. So like disco and like I'll reference certain old songs like, you know, bounce, rock, skate, roll, bounce. I'll reference things like the 99 cent store. But then I'll also populate the images with with uh, like text from like Fanon, you know, or like, um, you know, um, you know, line, verses from like, my favorite poet, which is June Jordan, you know what I'm saying? And like, uh, maybe some Akan, which is like a Ghanaian language or like Vietnamese. We have a very large Vietnamese population in, in the BX, like refugees from Cambodia and Vietnam that came in the early nineties, you know? So there's, so all of that, all of that. Um, I'll show you a few more images. How am I doing on time? Cause I keep going, Jaden. <laughs> We're, all, we're almost halfway through time. Okay, all right, so let me switch to the other shit. All right, so like, you know, I'll just show a couple images. So here, a few more images of the drawings. Um, all 
And this is the second mixtape. And again, like this is a guy from my neighborhood. His name is Scar, everybody calls him Scar. He's got Scar written on his hand. And so like I referenced that, cold crush cicatriz, which is Scar in Spanish, you know? Women, women in the park with the kids, you know? And then when I came to the residency, I was like, okay, well, I wanna make reliefs. I was making reliefs. Um, 2016, I was making like, uh, like trying my hand at ceramics. You know, it was like one of the last things I got into right as I was leaving grad school and I was like good at building. For me, uh, building with clay felt like drawing. Like it's the same sort of, um, same logic to it. So, so I picked it up and, it was, and I was good at it and I really wanted to get back to a place with a kiln and that's not an easy thing to do. I got lucky, a place opened up here for me. So I'm like, I wanna continue where I left off in terms of like building these reliefs the one that you guys used to uh, to like promote this talk, actually, Arlene Davila, who's like in this talk, actually has that hanging in her apartment. So you know, they they hang well and they look good. Ask Arlene; she'll tell you all about it. Um, but like, I wanted to sort of continue because I only made three. It was like kind of experimental. I was trying to figure this shit out, um, and I came here with a plan. Um, the first one I made is actually sitting right there. Let me let me stop sharing so that. Uh, Y'all can see. Can you pin me? Or can I pin myself? I've just pinned myself. All right. So so the first one I made was this one right here. Um, and it's based on like a like I've been messing with this with this like uh, cornered, hair raised, semi-feral cat. Sort of like as a kind of like a a metaphor for like how I think people are feeling these days, you know, like the times are rough. But you know, more 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 than just the cat itself as like an analogy for how how we're all feeling, you know, um, like I'm very interested in like the space that it lives in. So that tiling is just so classic New York building, you know. And so like the other side of it is like me archiving, like I like you know as like Caitlin mentioned in my bio, like you know like okay, these are spaces that are disappearing. You know, these are spaces that are disappearing, whether it's like the people being disappeared through displacement and gentrification or just like hyper speculation in New York and everything's becoming glass and all these things. So like there's a, you know, as I said, like, you know, like my my grandparents got here in 1957, you know, we were part of like the industrial migrants that came in to work all the factories. And then, you know, so many changes have happened. You know, like, and you've had artists like, you know, Reginald Marsh and the Ash Can, like Hopper and these people who were like kind of documenting, like, who were the working people of that time, you know? I think I'm interested in like picking that up, you know, people, you know, there's been people who have done that in the 80s, like, you know, Martin Wong and Jane Dixon and like folks who were like, just like looked at the working people and looked at the, uh, the enclaves and the neighborhoods that we formed and like how we thrive, I, I'm, I'm interested in that because these things are disappearing and you know, they're, they're disappearing at an accelerated pace. The more, the more that, you know, like the elites uh, use land and real estate as a way to like, sort of like hide and wash their money, the, you know, that's why you have a city full of empty glass structures and a homelessness problem that's like just out of control, like literally out of control. So so, you know, like, what are the spaces and who are the people that are getting disappeared? So I kind of zoom in and I look at like the crown molding, the tile, like these things need to be like archived and remembered. Or I zoom out and I'm like, okay, just sitting, the simple act of sitting on the stoop, you know? Sitting on, so I have this, I think I have a shitty picture of this one I'll show you guys. Um, so I kind of been working on those. Let me, let me share one more time. You should go back to these photos. Boom, boom, boom. Yeah, so here's like kind of a close up of like what this is looking like because it's kind of blurry in the background. But you know, just like the simple act of sitting on the stoop, you know, and these are all reliefs, they're ceramic reliefs, they'll be hanging on the walls. I built them with white stoneware. I, before when I built it, it was more groggy of the clay, which wasn't as smooth. These are still not that smooth is because you know, like I'm not a ceramicist, I'm like really just experimenting out here. But you know, they do what they do, you know. And then like, you know, waiting to dry and, you know, have his like, his time in the kiln are pieces like this, which is like, 
the storefront. And I'm definitely thinking of Martin Wong's storefront paintings. You know, I think like uh, this is something that's so like New York, you know, these storefronts. So like, you know, the old teenage graffiti writer me wants to like bomb the shit out of that gate. And I will, but with a paintbrush on this one, not outside, <laughs> allegedly. <laughs> And then, um, and then of course, like the radiator, like, so if, if, you know, I'm imagining the people that are in this, in this Zoom are like people who take classes here or like, you know, like uh, really a part of the like community at this pottery house, you are, you know about the, the, the radiator in the bathroom in the back, like, you know, it's kind of hard to ignore that cute little radiator. It's not something that you're going to find many places. Central air is a thing in other places across the United States. This is, this is like, you know, uh, Something that I, that is, I think, is important to be remembered. And so, this the others that I've painted so far. I've just been painting with enamel, and not putting through the glaze system. But I think with this one, I'm going to do. Uh, I got it right here. I wrote that shit down. Terrace gelata, which basically is like, you know, is this kind of glaze that would kind of give it like a peely kind of, you know, like these things. Listen, I heard that Jackson Pollock used to be the janitor in this place, right? And I'm like, maybe we need to go back to the history books and think about maybe all of those abstract expressions were just like looking at peeling paint in their shitty New York apartments because, you know, there's such a like, I don't know, there's something there. There's some mark making naturally that happens there. So I'm very interested in this getting like that peely sort of like, you know, oxidized kind of quality. And we're going to play with that if it survives this time in the kiln, pray for me. And then, um, um, and then this is the the last piece that I made, uh, which is more like you know a little bit off the beaten path of what I've been doing. You know, this one's a little bit more allegorical. It's playing with an old proverb. Uh, you know, very pretty pretty self explanatory. Eye for an eye, tooth for a tooth. Um, I got the reference in here somewhere. Yes, yeah, so I, I, you know, like I have this image I've been sort of like hanging out with for a minute. You can see it. if you see me in the little box, you can see it. It's like just this old adage, these old proverbs. You know, and this is something I've made a drawing of before. Uh, so this is like a drawing I've made of it before. So I've thought about it before. There's the gate again. There's the graffiti. The, the, the names, the tags that are on the drawing itself are like tags that like, I've grown up looking at these tags. These are tags of people from the Bronx or like, you know, like my, the, my elders, you know what I'm saying? And so like, these are not people who will fall on anybody's radar in the art world. I don't even think that that's something that they want themselves, but like, again, archiving people, places, things that must be archived because our stories get erased our stories get left behind and who is responsible for telling history you know what i'm saying and like you know so we decolonizing what 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 the what the vision is through through action and through art you know um so yeah and i actually and i'll just i'll just i'll pop one more thing just regarding the stoop guys stoop guys uh they get a lot of love in my in my work you know so like here's like a, a print that i'm making i also hang out a lot at the robert blackburn print shop if you've ever taken classes there, you should, because they're great. Um, and so this is like a white ground etching with some chincole. And, you know, like the stoop guys, you know, that's neighborhood watch, man. You know, so the perched perched on the stoop. So it's like, it's like repeated, like, I guess the, the word, the right term would be like motifs uh, for me, you know. I, I think that's a good spot to stop. What you think? Was that about 40 minutes? Yeah, I think that's pretty good. Uh, and, you know, you stopped just in time. We just got a, a question in the chat that I can ask you to, to start off so no one feels shy. Um, so the first question is from Jane. And the question is, do you share your artwork in your community to provoke conversation and community? And if so, what kind of reactions have you gotten? Well, uh, most of the time, like, you know, I'm, I'm painting people from my community. So like they like, you know, they, some people on my block call me professor, <laughs> which is funny. But, you know, like, so there's that engagement where, like, you know, like, people are seeing, like, I have to ask people to take their picture, you know, like, it's not just images off Google. 
sometimes it's on the slide because they're doing something that I want to capture and I don't want to ruin the moment. But most of the time I'm like having to explain myself why this crazy stranger wants to take my picture. And then that opens up dialogue for me to be able to like build relationship, more relationships in my community, you know? Um, but like, uh, like as a community organizer, like my work is, I haven't like, I got out of grad school in 2013, 2014. I'm like paying attention to being an artist now. You know what I'm saying? Like most of the work that I've been doing has been political work. And a lot of that has been lending my, 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 my super, my art superpowers to that. So be it through propaganda, be it through like, you know, you know, holding space with images or like all kinds of things. So like, yeah, my work is definitely circulated. Before the pandemic, I was going to have an art show at the, at the Chicken Azteca, which was, there's this like, uh, it's, this is like a restaurant in my neighborhood that had a lot of empty wall space. So like the idea was, is I was going to make some drawings, make a couple paintings and then hang them there just for people to see themselves in the neighborhood. Pandemic kind of ruined that. It didn't really happen. You know, and in exchange for that, I would do a, I would paint a wall mural for the restaurant. The, the wall mural got painted, it's up, but you know, like I never did the show, but you know, like there's that, it's, there's always that exchange in many, on many different temperatures. Any other questions? Or if there's any images? Oh, somebody got a question. Yeah, I got a question about, uh, so I'm new to New York, you know, I've only been here like nine months. And as I walk around, I'm, I moved from Boston and I'm so impressed, like the, the, the character and the quality of every neighborhood in New York is so very different. And I wonder, like you talked about weaving and, and I wonder like your thoughts about, do some neighborhoods like actually, we like weave means that people kind of interact, like, what are your thoughts on like the different neighborhoods and do people actually weave and, you know? Well, are you saying, are you asking about the weaving in terms of uh, people in the community or neighborhood to neighborhood? Yeah, neighborhood to neighborhood. Like what are your general observations about your neighborhood, your blocks, as opposed to others, you know? Uh, I think what you, I, this, I could go about this question many different ways. So I'm just gonna shoot my shot. Um, Yo, like somebody who's like focusing on doing a lot of political work for like really the last decade, what I can tell you is, and you know, like kind of like on hiatus from that for a little bit, you know, I can tell you that the, what I've walked away, the questions that I have walked away from that continue, like have been more solidified, which is, um, before you can organize a tenant union, before you can uh, do really almost anything, you have to solve the problem of alienation. You have to solve the problem of alienation. Like you have people who live on your floor that you have never actually met. And that is a problem. That is a huge problem because through the alienation is how we lose power through the alienation is how you can have uh you know things get decided for you and then you know like things are so bad well how did it get like this you know um and so um so that is like a political project and but also something that i'm thinking about through the work not because my work is like i don't like to cross the streams you know what i'm saying like but my subjectivity and like my lived experience is just going to come out in the work by osmosis you know so i think that like uh like that is a work in progress, you know? There is the potential for a weaving of the social fabric and it happens in different registers, right? You know, like uh, me learning how to say certain things in Bangla, in Bangla so that I can speak to the Bangladeshis in my neighborhood. You know what I'm saying? Like, or, you know, like it happens on different, in, on different registers. But, you know, of course there's, 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 uh, there di there's dynamics of power, there's different, there's so many different, like, in terms of like, you know, people who make more money, like, you know, middle class versus like Im immigrants, uh, you know, incoming gentrifiers and longtime residents, you know, like um, landlords raising rent and setting everything off, you know, like, like 
once once the windows are once they fix the intercom and the windows get replaced you know something's coming you know there's a problem so you know it happens it's never it's never just like something that is accomplished it's always something that's moving like this because of the way that new york new york is a very interesting unique thing you know like it's known as a transient place but but there are people who have been living here for generations and raised families here for generations and they're not Lenape, they're not Lenape, they're not the indigenous people of New York, but they're kind of stewards of the lands by virtue of like blood, sweat and tears. And I'm not talking about settlers. I'm talking about like, you know, neither settler nor native, you know what I'm saying? Like, like people who are brought here through forced migration for work because, you know, their land's been colonized and they have to follow their resources to the empire or, you know, Jim Crow, for example. So there's there's just there are so many ways where like our struggles are interconnected, you know. Um, what, I'll give you one example, and you know, like my work always goes into teaching mode, you know, because they may be they may be uh, pretty to look at and nice colors and everything, but they do the work of, of of asking you to think about what the content is. And when we get into that, then we're now we're talking about things, and now we can maybe construct some things. But one of the things is you know like. Uh, um, you know, uh, delivery dr drivers, delivery guys are organizing themselves because they're tired of getting robbed and they're tired of, you know, like bad conditions with Grubhub and Seamless and all these people. But there's a language barrier and there's like a cultural barrier. Most folks don't, like most migrants that come here from like Mexico or Central America, they don't know the history of the United States. So they don't know 500 years of slavery for African-Americans, you know? And African-Americans, may or may not know even like know the difference between Honduras and, and Mexico, you know? And so there is like a non understanding of people's like context. Who can weave that together? How do we weave that together? How do we get, um, you know, the delivery guy to understand that African Americans did not gain, get their papers Till 1964, 1965, with the Voters' Rights Act and the Civil Rights Act, that's when they legally become citizens as African Americans, or that there were migrants and refugees within their own so-called country, the country that they built, literally escaping apartheid from the South. And so when you like look at it like that, through like labor, through immigration, then you see that like there's are parallels to our stories and why we all came here, and like what we're doing together. And so it's about like going in with a needle where, wherever you can on different scales to like bridge that, bridge it and bridge it and bridge it, you know? And it's like, it's a, it's an ongoing project, you know? Like we're ancestors in training, man. You know what I'm saying? Like, like what, what, how are we weaving while we're here? I don't know if that answered your question, but you know. I really like that ancestors in training. That's, yeah, that's great. Um, you've got, so um, several people have said thank you and had to leave. So I'll, I'll say that out loud, but um, there's one question that I'd like to read out, uh, which is from Kiani. And Kiani asks, or says, the way you activate and retranslate the Buddy Esquire posters is powerful. Are there other pieces within the archive that you draw inspiration from? Are there any what? Are there other pieces within the archive that you draw inspiration from? Which archive? Yeah. I think this is a broad idea of archive. Um, well, like my, I call my shit a like my work is like I call it the baroque. You know, like like I, but I call it a broke baroque. It's baroque, you know, like you know, or like or like a baroque from below, or like you know, again, I'm very interested in anagrams and puns and shit like that. So if you scramble the word baroque and you switch the letters out, you get quebrado. But you don't get quebrado like you know how they would say in Spain. You get quebrado like a patwa, like an Antillian way of speaking, with no D, you know. So then it becomes an anagram of it, and you know, like so, like, and so why? I mean, I don't even know if we have time to talk about it, but I'll say a little bit, you know, like you know, it's like this idea that there's like you know, like the emotive, the emotive manipulation of the Catholic Church and and how that has maintained colonization and imperial, imperialism on our people gets reversed when you think about like, so like I, 
So, so that's the church, right? That's the state, that's the government trying to figure out how to do that at that time for the artists. The artists are like, you know, Caravaggio don't give a shit. You know what I'm saying? Like Caravaggio is like, I want to know how I can make people feel something when they look at my shit. Let's focus on like how to emote through, through, through the medium, you know, and get some money from the folks, you know? So like, you know, there's that. And then there's a subversive quality of like from below or like, you know, um, to, to scramble it, which is graffiti writers understand, like, you know, you have graffiti writers and you have Andy Warhol. And they both understood at the same time that advertising was something that was the zeitgeist and it was doing something. Andy Warhol runs off to make silkscreen prints Graffiti writers are like, wait, you mean I could write my, I could put my shit up wherever I want, like billboards? Oh, I'm climbing on the train and I'm tagging and it's gonna go all city from, from Brooklyn to like, you know, to the tip of Manhattan, you know? It's the same understanding. It's a taking of the thing and, and making it something as in like, of course, city of New York is like, that's not what we meant. And it's like, well, you know, like, but it's a taking of the, taking of the mechanisms and throwing it back. You know, and like, so like there's, so then the Baroque is like a decolonial approach of like just whipping back at the Baroque. It's like the, it's the guerrilla warfare in, in the work. Okay, and I see uh, Catherine has, has raised their hand. If, if you wanna un unmute and ask the, the question that you've got. Let me, let me stop share so I can see people. Hey, Shaleen, it's Kat. Oh, um, what's hey, up, Kat? How are you doing? Um, so I guess I was wondering, I got, I like tuned in pretty late, but um, thinking about hip hop and coming out of like the nadir of the deindustrialization and like white flight, there's been kind of like a second white flight, I feel like, and like rich flight because of the pandemic. And um, I've noticed like I have family in Miami and they're like, rents are going up in middle class neighborhoods like it's it's like the new yorkers are just kind of spreading out to mexico city and all these other places um well rich people anyway not necessarily just new yorkers and i was wondering um if you've noticed any return to that period i feel like there's kind of this like fear mongering right now about like oh we're going back to the old new york and like the city's yeah. falling apart. It's 1977 again. Um, yeah. and like, and I, you know, and I think that there is definitely a, an energy that I haven't felt before, at least in a long time. But um, do you see, obviously there's been a lot of terrible things that have happened, but do you see any positives or new creative possibilities coming out of this? You know what? I think about that shit all the time. And here's a, here's like a shameless plug. Like I'm gonna be in conversation with Sarah Schulman and Jane Dixon about this probably sometime in March. I gotta check my email to remember what day it is, but I'll let y'all know. But um, I think about this shit all the time because you know, like, uh, you know, while while the '70s were what they were, you know, like who put the like, you know, who I mean, that's a Rockefeller. That was a Rockefeller induced bankruptcy. Like, you know, if you read Fear City, if you read. Uh, uh, how New York was branded, um, you know, like I can give you all those references so y'all can check this out, check those out. Like, um, you know, the, the like the bubble bursts and then like who's left to deal with that are like, you know, regular working people. Um, in terms of like, like migration patterns, like, you know, it's, it's, it's interesting. It's interesting. I would, I would venture to say, and you know, this is my, might be controversial, but you know, like, you know, um, um, like Puerto Rican, African Americans that have been in New York for generations, you know, who were able to like, um, you know, get those public sector jobs, they've kind of become the Italian and like, you know, like Irish Americans of New York of yesteryear. They kind of like graduated to that place. And so they become the bureaucrats of the city, but they also like, um, you know, they might be able to like go to Florida, or go to Pennsylvania, you know, like now every, not everybody goes in the same way. Some people are able to buy a house because it's easier to get something over there. A lot of us just go over there to get caught up in the penitentiary system, you know, or like get, get a meth problem or some shit, you know, like, um, 
the shift is happening. I think it's because of the hyper speculation that people are just scrambling and don't know where to go. And so that you have your resources. Um, but I think what happens in New York, like, you know, we're in the midst of crisis, crisis induced, not in the same way in the seventies, but induced by the elite nonetheless. Um, but we have a playbook. We have a playbook of what were the things that were created. Like the seventies gave us cult, it gave us hip hop. It gave us the Times Square show, collab, real estate, ABC, no Rio. It gave us the use of space organically by the people grassroots. We know how to do this and we're standing on that legacy. So, you know, uh, you know, Eric Adams will like, you know, they put a strong man in power, like, you know, the, the you know, the black cop. So it covers all the bases. Now you don't have uh, black lives. You can't, you can't be yelling black lives matter at, at, at the mayor. No more, you know what I'm saying? Like they cover all their bases and you know, like, but it's to solidify for, for the rich. Conditions will never change for us. And so like in the crevices, in the crevices of their, of their decaying power, in the crevices of their, um, of their, uh, um, of their, their lost grip of the bullshit, um, there's opportunity for us to reweave and to figure out how to live together. We can't wait for the template. We can't wait for them for the, to provide the template because the template only shores up their power. And the template as it is, has a met, like a crisis on their hands where New Yorkers are locked out of the housing here. We can't, like their secession is like challenged. Like you, your kid can't move into your apartment that you age out of because of the landlords. Or you know what I'm saying? like. Uh, like renting here is impossible for a young person. Like uh, the gentrification is, most people who are gentrified out of Brooklyn are in shelters in the Bronx. They don't just leave, they just get hidden from the system. And so, you know, like the system will shore up that power. It will continue the status quo. And then what happens when it starts to crack? Oh, you need a strong man. No, you need to give housing to people and you need to take care of the mentally ill in your city, period. Mm -hmm. and, like building another jail is not solve, not gonna solve anything. It's just more of the same shit. So, you know, there's a looking, just to wrap it back into the art thing, you know, you know, there's a, there's a looking at the thing, like, you know, what is before you as is. There is looking at the, the material conditions as is. As an artist, our power is to look, to see deeply. There's a doing that in real time and then there's a bringing it back into the studio. And then like, how do we like, you know, it's the same power source of looking. I'll just leave it there. Thanks. You're welcome. Oh. Um, okay, I think the, the last question we got through the chat um, is, do you have an audience in mind when you're creating your work? Like a, a specific audience in mind? Huh. Well, that, that, that was easy. We, we could have one last question if anyone else has a, a question then. Okay, then I think that was the, the last official question. Um, all right. Oh, no, there's, um, I love your work and that's all. You are a leader. Salud. Um, okay, then I think uh, I'll just say thank you to everyone. Uh, thanks thank so much for coming. Thank you, thank you Shaleen. Um, and training this shit. Yeah. Um, okay. Well, everyone have a great night and thank you so much. <laughs>